All right, so I am recording right now. Um, this is the Tuesday, Thursday class. So if anyone has checked out the recording from last Thursday, it's only a very short one because I think I hit one of the keys and stopped the recorder. Uh, so what you can do is to watch yesterday's lecture because I went through exactly the same topic for my Monday, Wednesday class. So if you want to go over the topic again, you can watch the Monday, Wednesday class yesterday it would go through the same topics. <clears throat> and I'm double checking right now so to make just to make sure that everything is up and running. Okay, and I need to check it occasionally because you know, it's just uh, sometimes I click the wrong key at the wrong place and OBS you know, ends up stopping the recording. All right. So what we'll do today is not to introduce any additional ideas or concepts and instead we're going to go through the exam from spring 2023, which is last semester, <clears throat> which I think I have sent out you know, using the announcement you know, some time ago. So we'll go through the go to the announcement and go find exam one from spring 2023. I hope some of you, hopefully all of you, have had a chance to take a look at it and try to figure out the answers. If not, well, we're going to go take a look today. So the PDF is already here, and you can just click on the PDF, download it, and you'll use it you know, for today's lecture. <clears throat> so I'm going to get started here with the, with the test. Now, this is the actual exam in 2023 in spring, which is last semester. However, do not think that your exam is going to look like this, you know, or if you see questions that are similar, do not assume they are exactly the same, because I try my best not to use the same questions from past semesters. All right, but the instructions still apply, so I would kind of go through the instructions. Uh, the exam is an individual exam specific to the student with the ID stated above. That is actually no longer true. I used to do that. You know, every student has you know, that particular person's specific exam, but I don't do that anymore. But instead, there is an exam ID, which has nothing to do with your student ID. It's just a way for me to find out, you know, okay, where is the key for this particular exam uh, set of exam questions? Uh, no collaboration is permitted in the attempt to answer questions of the exam. So that's kind of important, okay? <clears throat> Paper-based content that was prepared prior to the exam can be used as long as no interaction or collaboration is involved in the attempt to answer questions you know, of the exam. This is a typo. <clears throat> so that means you know, anything that you have handwritten or printed prior to the test you can bring it with you, okay? So in case you say, okay, I have found you six textbooks that have content that is related to this class, can I bring all six textbooks? I go like, yes, as long as you find enough space to do it, bring those you know, extra you know, uh, resources with you, not a problem. If you say, can I bring you know, the modules that you know, in from Canvas, you print them out and bring it with you? Yes. If I can locate you know, all the exams from the past 10 years, can I bring those you know, past exams? Yes. With answers from past exams? Yes. Okay? So the requirement of being on paper, but other than that, on paper and prepared prior to the exam, anything goes. Okay? Now, when I say paper, I exclude e-paper. So you know, people cannot bring in a tablet and go like, but this is e-paper, so technically it has paper in it. No, that is not paper. Okay, so paper means you know fiber paper. Okay, some tree has to die for this paper kind of paper. Are we good so far? Okay, what kind of material you can bring with you? So on the day of the exam, you know we'll have all the computers retracted, so you have more desk space. Okay. So you might want to come a little bit early just to make sure that your space is properly prepared for the exam. <clears throat> there are no classes before this one, so that means you, know, you can really come early. The classrooms are now unlocked you know, from uh, the start of the day. 
Do not share or discuss any part of this exam with anyone in class or otherwise until the next class meeting or otherwise permitted by the instructor. Because some people may not be able to take the exam for medical reasons. So I don't want people to be sharing, oh, do you know, you know what is on the test, you know, or, you know, stuff like that. Uh, grading is based on the explanation and steps, demonstration of understanding of knowledge and problem solving skills, not just the final answer. So unless otherwise stated in the question, sufficient explanation means your answer connects definitions and concepts discussed in class via logical and or mathematical steps to find the answer of a question. So you have to show me how you connect the dots. So I'm not just concerned about the final answer. I'm also concerned about how did you get to the final answer? Write your answer on answer sheets. Okay, so um, I have stopped you giving people enough space to put their answer. So you have to bring your own pieces of paper to write your answers on. Is that clear? Okay, so bring your own paper. If you prefer just your blank paper with no lining, that's good. If you prefer lined paper or graph paper, that's fine too. So bring whatever paper you feel most comfortable with when you're answering questions. All right, so questions one to five are about the same, but yours would not be exactly the same because we haven't, have not talked about the overflow flag nor the L flag. So that means you know, your kind of question will be significantly easier compared to you know, what the previous class you know, or the previous semester has to do with. It doesn't mean that we, we are not going to, I'm not going to teach you know, the overflow flag. It's just that it's not going to be a part of exam one. Instead, it will be a part of exam two. That's all that means. So with all the questions here, there are only like one or two that I can go, that I can talk about because you know, all of these mention the overflow flag, and the, this one is the only one that's not, that does not mention the overflow flag. So we'll start with this one. <clears throat> all right, so I'm going to copy the uh, question onto my tablet, and then I will switch to the tablet to kind of highlight you how to answer that question. So uh, you cannot see it right now because I'm just kind of writing on the tablet right now, and I don't have the uh, tablet mirroring turned on just yet. So. There we go. And now I can go ahead and try to start it. Give me a second here. Oh. All right. Okay. So I need to get a terminal emulator. There we go. All right. So let's see how that works. And move that your view like so okay all right so the only thing we know is d0 is a 1 t1 is a 0 and this is a 1 bit subtractor okay so the question is what is x0 what is y0 what is q0 what is t0 those are the, th the things that we do not know all right so we are only given D0, we are only given T1, the values of those two, and we have to figure out the other four bits. So the question is, how do we approach this problem? So I'm going to use the more conventional way of writing you know, the, so we have X0 minus Y0, that should give us Q0, and then minus T0, that should give us D0, and then on the other side, Okay, it doesn't actually tell me where I'm touching. I thought I turned on the touch indicator, but it does not. So, <clears throat> so I have to use the mouse pointer, which is you know over here. What am I supposed to put here? Oh, that's T1. Okay. So that's the overall structure of a one-bit subtractor. And yes, we can have a one-bit subtractor as weird as it might seem. So now the big question is, um, what is given? So I'm going to use a different color here so that we can differentiate <clears throat> what is given to us. Oh, actually, the touch works now. Okay, so we know that you know, D0 is known. It is known to be a 1. So we look at this and go like, yep, we know this is a 1. And we also know this is a 0. 
Is that okay so far? Are there any questions about you know, what the question is giving you at this point? What is known at this point? Okay, so now what do we do? What are you going to do? What is, what is the process that you're going to take to answer this question? I have heard a lot of things, including prayers. I cannot speak to how effective that is, but I can tell you what I would do, okay? I would try to recall all the definitions related to this, okay? So the question is, what definitions are we talking about? Well, how is T of I plus one defined? How is Q defined? Um, and those are really the only two that are super important, okay? And then you go like, okay, so how, am I supposed to memorize all that stuff? The answer is actually yes. But what if I cannot remember all that stuff? Well, that's why you can bring in additional sheets of paper so you can have all the definitions written on that piece of paper so you can use it in the exam. And then what if you forget to bring that, you know, that pile of sheets of paper or the textbook? Then you read, in this case, the question very carefully. Because in this case, the question actually gives you all the definitions already. I already tell you that Q of I is XI exclusive or with YI. D of I is Q of I exclusive or with T of I. T of I plus one is the negation of X and the negation of X of I and Y of I or the negation of Q of I and T of I. Do not count on it, okay? You know, just because in this particular exam, the definitions are also given to you do not assume that in your test you will get the same thing. But I'm just emphasizing you have to have the definitions. Are we, do, are we doing okay so far with that? Okay. <clears throat> so knowing these definitions, how is that going to help us to answer the question? All right. So what do we know? Well, we know that D0, whoops, wrong color. Go back. There we go. Change it back to just the regular color. Huh. Now it won't let me. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. So we know that D0 is a 1. But at the same time, we know how D0 is defined. Can somebody remind me how D0 is defined using the definition that I just flashed a little bit earlier? The exclusive or between QI and TI. Very good. Okay. So this is the uh, exclusive exclusive or between QI and, and TI. So in this case, the I is a zero because we have D zero already known. So the I is a zero. Okay. Hmm. Well, that doesn't tell us a lot of stuff, but it gives me enough information to lock down to two possible cases because we already know what the exclusive or between those two bits are. So instead of having four possible ways of arranging, you know, D, a Q0, and T0, I'm now limiting to only two. Which two are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So they have to be different. One has to be a zero, the other one has to be a one. And there are two ways to arrange it. Exactly. Okay. So that's very good. Okay. So we know that we can have Q0 being a one, while T0 is a zero, or we can have Q0 being a zero and T of zero being a one. Because of what? Because of how D of zero is the exclusive or between those two. Are we doing okay so far? Okay, so this is not, this doesn't give me the exact answer, but it's really helpful. So what is the other clue that we have? What is the other thing that we know 
Oh, it's T1. We know what is T of 1. Okay. So we now, t of one, we now say t of 1 is known to be a 0 because that is what you're told here. Ah, yes, that actually shows. Can you guys see actually that little circle that appears for a while right there? Yes? Because I'm trying to use it to kind of direct your focus instead of using the mouse because then I have to move between two devices. But here, I can just look at this one thing. Okay, so t of 1 is known to be a 0, but at the same time, we also know the equation or the definition of t of 1 in binary. We know this is basically the negation of x of i and y of, okay, we shouldn't use i here. Let me backspace, because we know what i is. We know i is a 0, so we'll just be specific. This is negation, the negation of x0 and y0, or x0 and the negation of y0. Are we, are we good so far? Okay. So what I'm doing right now is to associate what is known from the question with the definitions related to those particular terms. Okay. Which is the one thing that you can do easily because it's like, okay, let me see what definitions we have. Which definition has that one single thing that we know on the left-hand side? Plug that in. Okay, so that would give you, you know, something like this. So what we know now, because of this, so we know this has to be a zero, and this also has to be a zero in order for the result of the disjunction to be a zero. Does that make sense? In order for disjunction to be zero, both sides of the disjunction or the or, they both have to be zeros. Are we good? Okay. All right. So we, okay, we know a, a bunch of stuff now. Actually, I, I apologize because I messed up. Go ahead. Can they also be one? Hmm? Can they also be one? Mm, no, because they, they, they have to result in a, okay, first of all, I, I, a mistake. I made a mistake here. This is not, this part is wrong. But, you know, this part, they both have to be zero in order for this zero to happen is true because we have an or. Okay, but as I said, I made a mistake here, and I did not read my own, you know, definition from earlier. So if you go back to the definition from earlier, it is the negation of Q of I and T of I. Okay, so I made a mistake, so I go back here and fix it. Okay, the negation of Q of 0 and T of 0. Okay. Close Okay, so hmm, now we look at this and go like, how is that going to help us? Well, see how this one here is the negation of Q of 0 and T of 0 has to be a 0? So you now plug in each one of these scenarios and ask, um, are they both going to make this 0? Is only, or is only one of them going to make the conjunction between the negation of Q0 and T0 a 0? So you plug it in. OK? So now you look at this and go like, okay, if I negate Q0 and T0, then we end up with a 0 in this case. On the other hand, if we assume that Q of 0 is a 0, T of 0 is a 1, then the negation of Q0, T0 is going to be a 1. Okay. Is that helping in any way? Okay. Are you guys seeing how this is going? Because now I can say, hmm, one of these two is not going to work. So now we can say this contradicts, contradicts that t of 1 is a 0. OK. Which means, um, no, Q of 0 cannot be a 0, while T of 0 is a 1. That cannot happen. So that leaves me with, that, with what? With only one possibility, right? OK. So now we can say this is the only choice left. This is the only choice. So now we can conclude. At this point, we can conclude, conclude 
Q0 is a 1, T0 is a 0. Are we okay so far? And I'm going to put, I will put a box around the conclusion because if that is significant. All right, so what, what have we figured out at this point? So changing to a green color here. We now know, you know, what this one is as well as what this one is. So now we look at this one and go like, yep, we know that has to be a one and we know that this has to be a zero. Is that logic okay? Does everybody understand the logic of how we lock down the value of Q0 as well as T0? Okay. So we only got x0, y0. The only remaining thing to figure out is x0, y0. So what is the clue as to what x0 or what and y0 can be? Well, we know Q0. Okay. So now we basically go back and say, hmm. Okay. So we say because, okay. this is because, okay, because Q0 is a 1, then we have two possible cases again. X0 is a 0, Y0 is a 1, or X0 is a 1, Y0 is a 0. Same argument, you know, because... It has to do with how Q0 is defined, so I will explain what that means. So I'm going to explain that this is because Q0 is X0 exclusive or with Y0. Is that making any sense so far? Okay. So out of the two choices, you want to lock down and say, well, can we tell for sure which one is the only case because the other one is not possible? The answer is yes, we have done this trick already. Because we look at this constraint here, the negation of x0 and y0 has to be a 0. Because otherwise, t1 would not have been a 0. So now we look at this constraint, and then we say, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in this case, um, the negation of x0, y0 would be a 0, which is good. Okay, But in this case, the negation of x0, y0 is going to be a one, which contradicts. Okay, so now I have to say that this thing here is contradicting with what I need over here. So I can now, you know, graphically, you know, I know this looks like a mess. So I can now say this and this leads to a contradiction. So that means you know, this has to be the only case. So now we can conclude that um, x0 is a 1, y0 has to be a 0. And then if I go back to the table format, and I'm going to use in green here, now I can conclude that this also has to be a 1, and this also has to be a 0. And now I have all the cases resolved. All the unknown values are now resolved. All right, so now that you know the solution of this specific question, it's like this. What are you going to do when you are studying? Are you going to print this you know, sheet out and just memorize the whole thing? What are you going to do? Any other equations through the same process? Mm -hmm. So you're learning the process not to memorize everything, okay? Because you know, what, what techniques did I use? Okay, so let's figure out the techniques that I used, which I think is more important, much more important than the actual solution in this case. So I will talk about the, the techniques that I use, okay? The first one is to relate the question to definitions. This is why I kept reminding everybody in this class to write down the definitions. Because the definitions is really important. You start with the relating, you start with the relationship between what is given in the question with the definitions. 
that we have already talked about in class. Okay? So, what is the result of this? You end up with constraints. What is a constraint? A constraint is basically saying, okay, not all possible cases can happen anymore because we know the exclusive or, the result of the exclusive or is a one, then we know whatever we are exclusive or ring, has to be, they have to be different. Or on the other hand, if we know the exclusive or, the result of exclusive or is a zero, then, let me see, yeah, if we know the result of exclusive or is a zero, then we know what whatever we are exclusive or ring, they have to be the same. Those are constraints, okay? Knowing something, even though you cannot resolve everything, it was to put a constraint on what is possible and what is not possible. So you work out all of the constraints first, okay? And once you have the constraints, then you look at the constraints and see what they depend on, okay? So you look at the dependency between the definitions. One of the most important definitions, or the most one of the uh, hidden dependency in this case, has to do with how Q of zero is in return defined as X zero exclusive or with Y zero. So you have to know the dependency of all of those things because you know, that gives you the ability to take the conclusion of one or more constraints and extend it so that you can resolve your further bits. Is that okay? So work out all the constraints, okay? I'm going to emphasize all the constraints. You know, what do we know at this point? Because T of 1 is this value, we have this constraint here. Because D of 0 is this value, we have those constraints there. And then out of those multiple constraints, okay, then you combine them and go like, this constraint tells us that these two things are possible. But of these two things, this constraint further restricts it and go like, no, this is not, this is not possible. So now you have one single possibility left. Is that okay? Because I think this is the, it's the problem solving process and this is basically a way for me to describe what I do to do problem solving. That is useful beyond this class. Okay? Do you think you need problem solving skills in a four year university when you're taking computer science classes? I would definitely think so. And once you graduate, you get a job. Do you think you need problem solving skills in order to not only to get a job, but to maintain your job, maintain your, your employment? The answer is yes. Okay. So do we have any questions about what I have described here? No questions? Okay. This is the first time I ever, in my you know, 23 years of teaching here, to try to describe the problem solving process. Um, and it's really difficult because you know, all this stuff is, I would use the word intuitive to me. So I can, I do this without consciously knowing what I'm doing. So it really takes a while for me to realize what I, uh, what, what I have been doing subconsciously but I think this is this describes it. Okay. Um, all right. So are we good with uh, this type, this kind of question? Good. Okay. Um, let me go to something else here. How many people like these uh, problems? Sudoku. Okay. It's the same thing. Constraint based reasoning. Okay, because of the known values of the of the grid, it places certain constraints already. Crossword puzzles, the same way. Constraint-based reasoning. Uh, some of you have watched the uh, it, the imitation game, you know, the movie, you know, in the uh, computer science club. And did you guys? How many of you went to that uh, computer science club meeting? Okay. And what was the way they? Um, recruit you know, people to join the recruitment team. Alan Turing de derived a method to try to find candidates to join his team of you know, cryptographers. 
So what was this? Bosworth puzzles, exactly. Okay, because you know, that is a line of reasoning. Okay, it's constraint based. You look at you know, all the things that you know already, and then you lock down the possibilities of what is left. Okay, so it's a very important way of thinking and solving problems. So I encourage everybody to at least try out a few games in the Sudoku and just understand you know, how you solve those problems because the skills that you gain by doing this is transferable to a lot of things. All right. Um, I can go on and on and talk about you know, how Sudoku ultimately you know, links to debugging programs, but that's kind of like way beyond the scope of this class. So I can talk about that after we got all the questions answered, okay, if people are interested. But for now, we are going to move forward and talk about question number six. Question number six is really just asking to see if you know where the definitions are and, you know, and that sort of stuff. So once again, it is important to know the definitions. So we'll go ahead and take a look at question number six. Okay, so it says, okay, I'm just reading it <clears throat> statement by statement. Recall that VUWM is the unsigned interpretive value of a binary number W using the least significant M bits. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to pause here. Does that sentence ring a bell? Do you remember how we defined VU as a function? And do you remember the whole discussion of unsigned values or the unsigned value represented by a binary bit pattern? Okay. So by the time we take this exam, which is next Tuesday, you probably want to say, yes, okay, I know what VU is. I know what is the unsigned interpreted value of a binary bit pattern. Okay, so that's knowledge. That is, that's not reasoning. That's just reading the text. You're know, reading your own notes and what we talk about in class. And then it says here, let v u x three be five and v u y three be seven. Answer the following parts in the specified order. Note that each part needs to be answered satisfactorily in order for the following parts to be graded. So that means you know, if somebody does not answer one particular part satisfactorily, then I would choose not to grade the further parts. So it's sequential. First question, or the first part of question number six, figure out that the binary representations of x and y show all steps for each bit. Both the binary representation of x and y should be three bit. In other words, I'm asking, what is the bit pattern X? What is the bit pattern Y up to three bits? So how would you solve that problem? How would you show me that you know how to figure that out? Well, if you have plenty of time, like an infinite amount of time, then you can use the formula to figure out each and every single bit. Do you remember that equation? There's a definition to figure out digit I given a certain base. That's a, it's a very generalized equation. Okay, so since some of you are turning your head, I'll just give you the answer. D of i is the floor of something, mod n, n being the base. B is the value, and you divide it by the base. Oops, sorry, I take it back. N is not, I use B for the base. So B to the power of i. Does that look vaguely familiar? Because if it does not, we have a concern. We, we have something to be to worry about. If you go like, yeah, I kind of remember that. What is it used for? What 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 is the purpose of this equation? What does it do? You have one single unknown on the left hand side, and then on the right hand side we have a whole bunch of symbols. What are those symbols? What is the purpose of this equation? Do you remember? Okay, very good. So I can give you the answer right now, okay? V is the value to be converted into base B, and then I is the position of the digit that we want to figure out. This method only figures out one digit at a time. It is rather tedious, but it works. So that means, let's say we are trying to answer the question. So the question is uh, saying V U X three is five, okay? So I write it here, VUX3 
3 is 5. So now I can say, okay, so the value is 5. B is 5 in this case. Uh, we are dealing with base 2, so B is 2. And I have three digits to work with. So for the first one is I have to work out what is digit 0, what is digit 1, and what is digit 2. So knowing all of these things here, you just plug this equation over here, then you can figure out what is D of I. Does that, is that making any sense? I'll work out one example, and then you guys can work out the rest. So when I equals to zero, all we are saying is D zero is the floor of five divided by two to the power of zero, the whole thing, mod two. Okay, let's work this out. What is five, what is two to the power of zero? Anything to the power of zero is one, okay? What is five divided by one? Five. What is the floor of five? Five. What is five mod two? One, okay? So now we worked out the result here as one. Then we have D of one, okay? I lied, I, I actually work out another case. So we have 5 again, divided by 2 to the power of 1 this time. The whole thing, mod 2. What is that? Well, let's figure this out. What is 2 to the power of 1? 2. What is 5 divided by 2? 2. 2.5. What is the floor of 2.5? 2. What is 2 mod 2? 0. So this is a way to figure out every single digit. And since the question asks that you show me how you do the calculation, I would, you know, do it like this, okay? This really spells out, you know, how the calculations are done and which definition you utilize to do all of these calculations. Are we okay so far with, you know, this answer? So I'm not showing you all the steps, but I would just say that, okay, after, you know, completing all of the steps here, X is 101 in base 2, Y is 110 in base 2 for this particular question. Yes? If the uh, number that it would be when transferred into binary would not be something that would overlap, can we just standard turn it into binary or would you want us to do it? What do you mean by that? 7 is 101 in binary. 7 is 101. Seven is not one zero one. Seven is one one one. No. Yeah, one one one. My bad. Okay. Yeah, but I'm not sure what you mean. What you meant by overlap? I didn't say overlap. Got it. Okay. Okay. All right. But does that answer your question, though? Is your question answered? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Somehow I accidentally answered the question without knowing how. But that's uh, okay. I'll take five. it. Sorry. Okay. Five, not seven. Yeah, five, five is one zero one. The answer we got. Yes. Mm -hmm. But you cannot just give me the answer of 101 because I need to know how you get to 101. Mm -hmm. You can always express it like, you know, 5 can be expressed as a sum of non-recurring powers of 2. And the only two powers of 2 in this case would be 4 and 1. 4 being 2 to the power of 2, 1 being 2 to the power of 0. And therefore, we have a 1 in digit 0 and a 1 in digit 2. Uh, digit two and a zero for digit one. That would be a reasonable explanation as well. Much more worthy compared to this. Yep. Um, is a, oh, why is a seven, right? Yeah. Okay, so I, all right, I stand corrected. Why should be one, one, one then? There we go, thank you. <clears throat> all right, so are we good with part one of question number six? Okay, let, let's go back and take a look at question, the part one of question number six. Figure out the binary representation of X and Y. But Ted, you never told us about the base. How do I know B is two? How would I answer that question? Binary number. Because it's binary, right, exactly. Binary means base two, okay? Show all steps, okay? And I think, you know, you know with the use of that equation, that is showing all the steps. Both the binary representations of X and Y should be 3-bit. 101 is 3-bit. 111 is also 3-bit. So I think, you know, all 20% should be um, 
you know, I should have gotten all 20 percent. You know, should the answer be actually more complete? In other words, this is not complete because I never really spell out you know this portion here, and I do not spell out you know um, the port the the equivalent three equations for y. So I never really show all that. But assuming that I did, then I would have gotten full credit for this part of the question. All right, what about um, part two? So part two says, in a binary subtraction using borrow look ahead, show all steps starting with, okay, another typo, starting with the definitions to figure out what is P and G. I'm going to pause right here. So how is P defined in a binary subtraction in borrow look ahead, and how do we define G of I also in that case? I can go back to my video recording and I can count the number of times that I remind people to say, write down the definitions, write down the definitions. If I get a penny for every single one of those mentioning, I would have been a rich man. Not really, but richer. Okay? So did you actually write down the definition of P of I, G of I for borrow look ahead? Okay, so what, what are they? Okay, P of I in binary subtraction is it does have to do with X of I, Y of I, but not exactly the conjunction. And there's a little bit of something in addition to conjunction that we need. Remember, okay, read the question very carefully. We are talking about subtraction, and this is a borrow look ahead, not a carry look ahead. So let's try again. Yes? Uh, P of i is not x sub i or y i. That is correct. G of i is not x i and y i. That is correct. Yep. This is why I have been reminding people to write down the definitions all along. Because in order to figure out the answers of the exams, you need to know your definitions. Is that okay? All right. Okay. So knowing that, so now we need to go back and figure out you know, what is P and what is G. So P is, in this case, the... Negation of x, the negation of x itself, okay, a bitwise negation, we turn all the ones into zeros and all the zeros into ones. So we have zero, one, zero here. And then we have a or with one, one, one. So p as a three bit number is basically the negation or the bitwise not, okay? So I'm going to use a tilde here to mean bitwise not of one, zero, one, or the bit pattern of one, 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 which is just one, one, one. In base two, g on the other hand is the negation bitwise not of one zero one, and the bit pattern of one one one, so that would be zero one zero, and one one one, and that would just be zero one zero. So then we, so now we we know what is p. So this is p p zero p one p two. This is. Uh, G0, G1, and G2. I'm basically using what is equivalent to a multi-bit gate, you know, on paper as an, as an expression. Are we okay with this notation? We good? Okay. All right. So we continue with the question. All right. So for another 25... Oh, okay. I have to continue to read on. You can also show your answer in individual bits. So if you want to say P0 is the negation of X0 or Y0, and therefore it is this, P1, P2, and then G0, G0, G1, G2, that's fine also. It's just a whole lot more wordy. It takes a little bit more time to write it out. But that's fine too. All right, so for another 25%, show the borrow look ahead equation of T3 your answer should start with C3 equals 2, blah, 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 okay? All right, so how do you answer that question? How do you approach this question? What is it asking? Okay, 
There are a few things that are super important. It specifically want you to use the borrow look ahead equation, okay? Which means, what is the whole idea behind carry or borrow look ahead? It solves a particular problem. What problem is it solving? Yep. The previous one. So we want to break the dependency between t of i plus one and t of i because we want t of whatever to only depend on the p, the g, and t zero itself. So now you have to say, okay, so when did we talk about the equation of t three that only relies on the p, the g's, and the t zero? The answer is we never actually talked about it directly, but we did talk about k three. And I also noted in class, you know, if you know what t k three is, change all the k's to t's, and you're done. You know the t. You guys remember that discussion, okay? So what you need to do is to look up the K3 equation, you know, using the carry look ahead equation, and then just change the K to the T, and that will be the answer. Okay, so I'll do that, yep. Do you just want the equation, or do we have to show you how we got it? Uh, this one, you know, for 25% of all the score with question number six, I just want the equation itself. So this is not even reasoning. This is just, let's look it up and copy and paste, okay? For being able to do that, you get 25% of all the points allocated to question number six. All right, so I'm gonna do that. Just like most people, I cannot remember those equations. So I will probably, you know, if I were to take this test, I probably would have all the definitions written on a piece of paper and bring it with me. So I would go to binary addition instead of subtraction because in the subtraction module, it never really say what is T of three, but we know what K of three is in the binary addition module. So that is down to binary addition right there, okay. Uh, I think it's actually here too, okay. That's an easy, way to, easy way to find it. And it's right here. So we have three lines corresponding to K of three. The question is, which line should I choose? I think we have talked about this also. The third one, because otherwise, why would I go through the derivation? So this is what we want. You go like, the question clearly asks about T3, not K3. Fine, change that to a T0, you're done. Because we talked about you know, how the structure of how T of I plus one relies on G of something, P of something, and then K of something, how that structure is exactly the same in the subtractor. And then we talked about how it's gonna have exactly the same format, except you, know, you just have to change you know, some of those things. So we'll go ahead, I'm going to copy this here, and we'll just, I'll just spell it out, T of three is G of two or P two G one. You cannot see it yet because I'm just copying it right now. P two P one P zero. K zero. Okay. Okay. There we go. All right. That's it. That's twenty five percent of the score associated with question number six. It's just being able to recall, okay, you know, look up, recall, whatever you need to do, and give me the definition of T of three in this case. All right, to finish up and get all the points associated with that question, we have for 35%, assume T of zero is a zero, substitute the bits of P and G in the borrow look ahead equation of T3, then compute all the conjunctions and then compute all the disjunctions, show all mentioned you know, computations. Okay, so that's just plugging in you know, what you know about uh, P, G, and T zero and finish up this calculation. Okay, so what we know about G is we have a zero for G two and then what we know about P two is it's a one, G one is also a one P2 is a one, P1 is a one, G0 is a zero. 
and then P2 is a 1, P1 is a 1, P0 is a 1, T0 is assumed a 0 in this case. Yes, I actually remember what P and G are you know, from the previous slide. But if you don't, that's okay, because you know, they are supposed to be in the same answer. So this is where we figure out, this is where we figure out you know, what is P and what is G. And from here, we know all the P bits are ones. And then from here, we know G0 uh, G is a zero, G1 is a one, and then G2 is a zero. It just turns out that I remember all of those things. Yep. So in that step where it says zero one zero and one one one, why does right. that equal zero one zero? Because it's a it's a bitwise and. It's the it's the same thing as using a multi bit gate. Okay, so okay, if you take this one out, it is the same thing as having a three bit um, logic gate, where you have you know um, zero one zero as one of the input pin. 111 as the other input pin. So the output in this case would be 010 because bit 0 of the output corresponds to the AND between bit 0 of the two inputs. Bit 1 of the output corresponds to the AND of the two, of bit 1 of the two inputs. And then bit 2 corresponds to the AND of the two, you know, uh, bit 2 of the inputs. So it's also known as a bitwise AND. And, as a, and that is why I use a single ampersand here, which also means bitwise end in, in C and C++. That's a good question. All right. So getting back to, I'm not quite done yet, right? So I go back to my next slide here. So I go like, okay, zero is a zero. Okay, that's pretty easy. That is a one, okay? This conjunction you know, gives me a one. This conjunction gives me a zero. This conjunction also gives me a zero. So and I take a look at all of these. The or of these four values is going to give me a one because we have at least one one in the entire disjunction. And that's why you know, we have, end up with a one over here. That's the answer. I mean, you can you can leave your answer like this in the in the graphical form as long as I understand what you're doing. It's good. So, are we doing okay so far? Okay. Now, this picture actually really shows you the power of the borrow or carry look ahead mechanism, because each layer, okay, this is one layer of gates, but one propagational delay. And this represents another propagational delay. Because in a circuit, the computation of all of the conjunctions, they all happen at the same time. In theory, they would come up with the answers all at the same time as well. So we only need two propagational delay in order to figure out the final answer. I think we talked about that as well. But I think this picture really helps to illustrate that particular concept. All right. So we have only one question left, unless you guys have further questions about number six. No questions? Okay, let's move on to number seven then. Okay, I'll start a new sheet here, and then go back to the description of the question. So question seven you know, says, recall that VSWN is the signed interpretation value of a bit pattern, W, using only the least significant N bits. So first of all, now you have to kind of try to remember what is V as of something. You are given that X is an M bit minuend, Y is an M bit subtrahend, and D is the difference or the result of X minus Y using an M bit binary subtraction. We discovered that VDM or you know, the VS of the difference is negative 15. Um, VSXM is 15, and VSYM is negative 2. Note that the scoring of this question may have part dependency. In other words, a later part may not be scored if an earlier part is incorrect, okay, typo, or omitted. Okay, so you have to really work on this one step by step, because if you skip a step, I will not grade it. I will not score the later part you know, where there's a missing step in between. So let's work on this step by step. 
for 10%, okay? I'm just asking you what is the definition of VSWN? Should I answer this part for you or do you already remember what that is? Can you find it in your own notes? Okay, what is the definition of VS of a bit pattern and up to a certain number of bits? What does it look like? Okay, so does anyone want to volunteer? The answer is... Hmm? It has a sigma notation in it. Okay. Okay, so I'm going <clears> to <throat> give you the answer step by step. Okay. Vs, and I think that in this case, Wn, okay, the name of the parameters is not important. Okay, it's a sigma. I going from where? Zero. Up to where? Hmm? And minus two. Very good. And what is each term that I'm adding in the sigma? Digit i, which is wi in this case, times 2 to the power of i. That's what each term looks like. And then what? There's one more thing next to it. Minus. minus. Okay, very good. This is important. It's a minus. Okay, W in this case, because I changed the name of the parameter. So W subscript N minus 1 times to the power of N minus 1. Yep, that's it. All right. So for the nth time, definitions. I have another penny in my pocket now. Okay. And it does, it's not just for this class also. Okay, for any math class, physics class, Anything that is STEM-based, definitions are important, okay? Def you, know, you really need to get all the definition, definitions down. And remember where to find the definitions. So that's why you have to write it down on your own notes, because um, in my you know, material, the definitions are all over the place. Because you know, in order to explain the definitions and why we need the definition, that's why we have all, I have all the stuff in between in the module. But in an exam, unless you want to read everything and just try to find the definitions in my stuff, having your own notes with all the definitions in one single place is going to be helpful. Okay? And I think I have said that probably five times already in the semester, if not more. Okay. Hmm? Increment and plus one. Yes, now it's plus one. Yes. <laughs> plus plus. <clears throat> All right, so that answers the first part, 10% already, right there. Second part, part two. What is the range of side values that can be represented using n bits? Specify the most negative value and the most positive value given sign, the sign integer has n bits. The answer to this part should be used to help answer the next two parts. Okay, so. It is in the module, okay? And you were asked to read the module even though you're here in the lecture. So you cannot just bypass the module and say, well, I'll just go listen to text in the lecture and get everything from the lecture. That is not going to work, okay? So you have to read the modules. So where do we find the range of values for a signed interpretation of a binary bit pattern? Yes. What's the congruent modulo stuff? It is. It's when we talk about uh, signed versus unsigned. So yes, you know the congruency. Yeah, I mean, uh, is modulo. Congruent modulo the specific thing that helps you figure out what is your upper and lower bounds? Yes. Okay. So we go back to this module, which I think has is here already. Yep. It's module uh, zero three five one. And it is a little bit, I wouldn't say hidden. It has its own paragraph. And it's in, in section one, has it having its own paragraph. Um, so if people are missing this part here, I really do not know what to say. 
Okay, I'm going to read it with you. Um, let's see here. Okay, based on the discussion of how values are represented by number, blah, 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 a base two number with digit zero to W minus one can be, so the range is from zero to two to the power of W minus one. This is for unsigned interpretation. And I believe there's one for signed interpretation. Okay, let's see whether that is here or not. Yep, right there. Not so you know, obvious, but it still has its own paragraph. Generally speaking, given a W bit integer, the range of unsigned value is from zero to two to the power of two W minus one. The range of int signed integer values is from negative two to the power of W minus one, the whole thing, to positive two to the power of W, the whole thing, minus one. So if you have missed that, you kind of have to ask how you have missed that. If you have not read the modules to begin with, then you have to ask why did why did not you why didn't you read the modules? Because the way this semester is gonna go is you really have to read the modules. This is all of this is relatively easy compared to the stuff that is yet to come. All right? So I'm just telling you, you know, what I have seen in the past for this class. Okay? So I'm just telling you it is important to read the modules. And as you read the as you read the module, you encounter these things, you have to write it in your own notes. Okay? So that you remember where you put it. Are we doing okay so far with those concepts of generally how to take a class, a college level class, especially in STEM? Are we good? All right. <clears throat> All right, so given that we have this equation here already, um, we just have to plug it in into our answer, okay? So the question is, you know, the names of the Parameters are changed a little bit, but that's okay. I mean, that's it simply means that we have to remember to change all of that to what we are given in this case. So W is, is not the width, N is the width in this case. So to answer that question, um, the most negative is two to the power of uh, two to the power of N minus one, the entire thing, and then the most positive is two to the power and minus one in the superscript, the whole thing minus one. I will write it out. Okay, so the second part of the uh, question is two to the power of the negation of two to the power of n minus one to, this is the most negative, this is the most positive, which is two to the power of n minus one, the whole thing minus one. Okay. All right. Well, I hope you know this is going to help guide you in terms of how you're going, what you're going to do to prepare for the exam. You still got a week to do it, okay? So there's quote unquote plenty of time. But I think you know that gives you some idea of what you need to do. All right. So for step three, for thirty percent of all the points associated with question number seven, I'm asking. <clears throat> Show the steps of how you figure out the min minimum number of uh, bits, which I call m of x, to represent x is 15 as a signed integer. That is the minimum x m of x such that v s x m x equals to 15. So what question number three or part three is asking is to make use of what you know from parts one and two combined with uh, v s x m x is 15 to try to figure out what m x is. So how do you figure that out? So we, we, switch, we, switch, back, we, switch, we switch back to here and then we say v s of x m x is already known to be what again? 15. Okay. So how do you figure out from just everything that we have written on the uh, whiteboard right now? Mm -hmm. 
The first question is, is 15 negative? Because if 15 is negative, then we know that we need, if 15 is negative, then we know this component here has to be non-zero, which means you know the most significant bit has to be a one. So the question is, is 15 negative? It's not, okay? So that means this particular bit has to be a zero. It does not mean that we do not have that bit. That bit has to be a zero so that we are not subtracting the highest power of two from the sum of the rest of the powers of two. Is that okay? So I'll write it down. I'll write down the reasoning here, okay? 15 is greater than or equal to zero. Hence, okay, I know you, you can use therefore or whatever. Therefore, uh, w of n minus 1 times 2 to the power of n minus 1 is a 0, which means w of n minus 1 is a 0. We still don't know what n is, okay? But that's okay. We'll figure out the rest. What about the sigma? What about this portion here? Well, since we don't have anything to subtract from, so this portion has to account for 15 itself. So the question is, what is the least number of bits in order for me to represent 15 as a base 2 number, as a binary number? How do you answer that question? Base conversion again, okay? So how many bits do I need? How do I represent 15 as a base 2 number? How do we do base conversion? We just did that earlier, right? There are other ways to do it, okay? Because a base two number is a sum of powers of two, non-recurring sum of powers of two, which means you cannot have more than one power of two in the sigma notation. So all you have to do is to say, I will keep adding up powers of two until I run out of your, your values to represent. Four bits is correct, okay? So you basically go like, okay, let's look at 15. Um, I'm pretty sure 15 has a one in it. And oh, you, you can work the other way around, okay? You can say, uh, I can look at 15, and then we ask, what is the largest power of two that fits in 15? Let's, let's think about that question. What is the largest power of 2 that still fits within 15 as a value? It's 8. Okay, very good. So after we figure out the 8, we have 7 left. What is the largest power of 2 that fits in 7? 4. And then we have 3 left. What is the largest power of 2 that fits in the value of 3? 2. And then we have one left. What is the largest power of two that fits in one? Zero. Two to the power of zero, which is one. So now we have two to the power of three plus two to the power of two plus two to the power of one plus two to the power of zero. So we have one zero 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 in base two plus one zero zero in base two plus one zero in base two plus one in base two, which is one 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 in base two. We need four bits. But wait, the answer is not four. Because we need 4 for only this portion. This portion, if you look at n, it is only summing up to n minus 2. So n minus 2 is 3. If n minus 2 is 3, what is n? Five. 5. Okay. So this implies that n minus, oops, n minus 2 is 3, because this is digit 0, digit 1, digit 2, digit 3. That's why n minus 2 is 3, because we need the, this portion here to be 3. So that implies that n is 5. We need 5 bits to represent 15 as a signed integer. Let me... Do you do okay so far? Okay. So the next part is to ask about why. 
So I'm giving you that y is negative 2. What is the minimum number y of m of y such that b s y m of y is negative 2? So we do the calculation almost exactly the same way. Okay, start a new page. So we look at you know, negative 2. And then the first question is, is negative 2 less than 0? Yes, it is less than 0. So that means you know, in the sigma notation, okay, so we, if we say sigma i equals to 0 to m of y minus 2, uh, y of i times 2 to the power of i minus uh, y of m y minus 1, times 2 to the power of m subscript y, the whole thing, minus 1. This needs to be 2, negative 2, sorry. Okay? So now the question is, um, what? how do I get to negative 2 using this equation? Hold on a second here. 2 itself is a power of 2, isn't it? Okay. So that means I can just say if m of y minus 1 is 1, and y of m of y <laughs> minus 1 is also 1, that's all I need. Because that, these two, will turn this term into negative 2 already. The rest of the bits, they're just zeros. We just make sure the sigma gives us 0, and that will give us the solution. Is that okay so far? Does everybody follow the reasoning here? Okay, we got some squint. We got some squints. So we'll I'll give you guys a little bit more time, and then I'll see if I can further explain this. Okay, so let's let's roll back. Are we okay with this equation here? Okay, because that's just by definition. Okay, and is are we okay with? we can turn this part here into negative 2 already by itself. Because it is the negation, is the arithmetic, arithmetic negation of y, a digit of y times a power of 2. 2 itself is a power of 2. Does that make sense? So if 2 is a power of 2, then we ask, what is the power? The power or the exponent is 1. 2 to the power of 1 is 2. So that's how we figure out that this part here needs to be 1. Because that would give us a 2. And then as long as this part here is also a 1, then we have 1 times 2 to the power of 1, which is a 2. The negation will give us negative 2. I don't need the sigma for anything. The sigma just needs to be 0. It just has to keep quiet. I can get negative 2 just from using one single bit of y. Is that part okay? Okay? Yep. You can use it. You can. No, law can get you only so far because we, ha we still have to rely on the sign flag or the you know, the bit that gives you the, the negative power of 2. So you can use log to get you close to the answer, but you still have to reason it out a little bit. So, so the log 2 of 2 is 1. So it will give you... So you... Okay. So if you log, use the log method, yeah. then the log 2, log 2 of 2 is 1. But what if you the other sign equals n minus 1? Because it's minus, or for the minimum, it'd be like minus 2 to the power of n minus 1, right? So if you have n minus 1 equals log base 2, 2. Mm -hmm. So what is the answer you know, if you use the log approach? It'll be 2 bits, yes. Mm -hmm. But in this way, it is also the same way, because you know, we know that m y minus 1 is 1, so m of y is 1 plus 1, which is a 2. So we come to the same conclusion like that. But yes, you can use log if you want to. So we do not do that. No, as long well as you show me the calculation that you use log to figure out the answer. But I'm only using the definition, so I'm not using log, which is not part of our discussion in this class.
You can use log. Okay, you can use more advanced mathematical tools if you have those tools. As long as you, as long as you show me how you got to the answer, I'm only using the definitions that we have talked about in this class, and only using addition and subtraction to get to exactly the same answer. Okay. All right. So, m of y is two. That's the answer, and this is how I derive the answer. All right. So that answers parts three and four. Part three gives me five. Part four gives me two. And then part five, for ten percent of the grade, you just have to find out which one is the largest. And what is the largest one between five and two? Five, right? So for ten percent of the score. You just have to say five, and then the last one is if I look at fifteen minus negative two, um, is the result going to exceed the range of a five-bit signed integer? The answer is yes. How do we know? We go ahead. Fifteen uh, can mm -hmm. be or it requires five bits, and that's the max that can be. Uh, yep. Attributed at that bit width. Yep. So anything being added that throws it off. Yep. Because you know, the the correct result is seventeen, but then when we go back to the range of values, we find out that um, with four, five bits, we can represent negative two to the power of four, which is negative sixteen, to two to the power of four minus one, which is fifteen. And 17 is out of this range, so we know the result of the subtraction is out of the range of a signed five-bit integer, and that's like the last five percent of the entire question. All right, so that's a quick run through of the various types of questions that I asked in spring 2023. Do we have any questions? Are they going to be similar to the questions you ask us next week? My typical answer is confusingly similar, which means they look similar, but they are there are there will be subtle differences. But I I do not even make any guarantee that it will, there will be resemblance you know, with the questions in spring 2023 because I don't have those questions yet. I have not made I have not made up the questions for your test. <clears throat> But I hope this helps to prepare, okay? Because what I'm testing is one: Do you know your definition? Do you have the knowledge? Two: Do you know how to apply the knowledge? Do you know how to use the definitions to figure out the answer? Most of the time, it is just based on the truth table of conjunction, disjunction, negation. It's based on what you already know about addition, subtraction. So you know, it's not going to be any. Super, you know, high-level math in this class. It is about how you use what you already know, and and as well as the definitions. All right. Any questions? If not for anything else, I really hope that you would start to read the modules like really carefully and slowly, and take notes at the same time, and put all the definitions to one place to prepare for that you know, few. Uh, your sheets of paper that you want to bring with you. Now you can bring as lot as much as material as you want. Okay, but I would say you know, um, break it up into a two-tier system. The first tier would be things that you intentionally write down for the exam, so it'd be concise. Everything has a certain place, color coded. You know, it's intended for the exam. It's easy to look up the definition. That's tier one. Hopefully that is only about one sheet of paper, preferably just one side of one piece of paper. I think everything that we have talked about can fit onto one single page. Now I write particularly small when I'm writing on a piece of paper, so you might end up with two pieces of paper. Okay. Then tier two would be all the backup material. Okay. Um, you can print out all the modules I have written so far. Okay. You can print out you know screenshots. Okay. Of the class, okay. You look at a certain screenshot. Go like, okay, that's a really helpful screenshot. I will just go ahead and crop it out and print it out. Okay. So those would be your backup material, which means just in case you forgot to write down something in your, you know,、um, two pieces of paper intended for the exam, 
you still have the backup material go like, okay, now I need to take a little bit more time to look it up, but it is still there somewhere. Okay, so I'll break it up into a two-tier system. Okay, you pre pre preferably you only need to use the first tier, but in case you know, you cannot find something in the first tier material, then it's in the second tier material, you just need more time to figure it out. But that's just me. If I were you, that's what I would have done. Doesn't mean that you should do the same thing. Okay, so you have to convince yourself what you need to do. All right, so do we have any questions? Oh, one more thing. I almost forgot. This is actually kind of important. So I am going to look up American River College Mesa. And it's right here. Uh, because I have heard about people you know, wanting to have uh, tutors. Are there any tutors for this class? So I'm just going to say, you know, the, tut uh, the Mesa Center has tutors who can tutor a range of classes, okay? Uh, math, chemistry, physics, computer science, a whole bunch of classes. It depends on who the tutor is on duty. The um, one thing you have to keep in mind is with Mesa, if you want to get tutored, uh, you have to meet certain qualifications. So it's right, okay, let me see, eligibility, there we go. So in order to be eligible to be, get, to be tutored at the Mesa Center, you have to be a first generation college student working to a STEM program, STEM to a degree, uh, qualified for financial aid. Okay, here's the STEM thing. Um, they didn't say anything about uh, whether all of these conditions are ended together or or I suspect they are ended together. So you have to meet all of these requirements to be uh, to become a Mesa member, and then Mesa members can be tutored by uh, Mesa tutors. <coughs> I do not make up these restrictions. You know, these restrictions are inherent to the Mesa grant. So in order for the school to get a grant to run the Mesa program, you know, they have to basically you know, abide by these specific rules. But it is a resource, okay? If you're eligible, it is a great resource. I highly recommend people to go to the Mesa tutor program if you are eligible for that you know, membership. Are we okay so far? Yeah, so if you're not eligible for that, okay, you know, the LRC potentially may have tutors you know, for certain you know, subject matter. I don't think there's a tutor for this class at the LRC. Um, another thing you guys can do is to study as a group, okay? That usually helps, okay? It depends on the composition of the group, um, but typically, you know, if you have a good group of people studying together, it helps to amplify the result, okay? It makes it more eff effective. Um, but you can also end up with a not so good, you know, makeup of a group. And uh, it usually does, you know, in that case, it can be worse than studying by yourself. So just different types of strategies to study for the test. And no, you cannot study with me. I do have office hours, okay? I'm going to re-emphasize that we, I do have office hour before this class, and typically I have time after class as well if you need to talk to me after class. So if there is a particular concept, you just have no idea, you, you have read it, you can spell it out, but you have no idea why it is like that or how we use the, that particular definition, come to my office hour. I'll be more than happy to kind of you know, tell you what I know. Alrighty. So since we had, since I did not cover any new material today, there's no lab because we are the next lab requires that you know something about binary comparison and the overflow flag. I cannot give you that one just yet. So we have no lab activity for today, but I can be here, okay, and stay here and answer questions related to the exam from spring 2023. And once again, I cannot tell you anything about your own exam one because those questions have not been created yet. I, you know, I don't have a time machine to ask my future self. So what kind of question are you gonna ask? Alrighty, so that's that for today.
in terms of the lecture, I will stay here as long as somebody is still here and want to ask question, or you can just be studying, you know, over here using the computers here. That's fine with me. But I will leave the lab as soon as everybody has left. Okay, but I'll be in my office, so you can go to my office to ask me questions you know, if that is the case. I'll stop the recorder right now and upload it. And fortunately, today I have recorded the whole thing. <laughs>